Hello everyone, this is Craig, the host of Acid Horizon. Just some quick news before we start. Recently, we collaborated with Radical Reprints. We assisted them in designing a new cover for a reprint of Georg Lukács' History and Class Consciousness. We have a link to the copy in the show notes. The proceeds from that book go to help mutual aid funds. One thing that we at Acid Horizon and our merch store, Crit Drip, did was over the past weekend, we donated 50% of our sales to those mutual aid funds. This is a tough time for a lot of people with rent and medical bills and so on. So we're doing our part to build solidarity. And within the next day or so, we're going to be announcing some other ways that we will try to build up those mutual aid funds to help people in need. Also, in just under a week, we will hold our second seminar for Difference in Repetition by Gilles Deleuze. This week, we plan to cover the introduction and a very small section in Chapter 5. Uh, so if you want to hop in, please join us on March 26th and 27th of 2021. Locate us on our Twitter account or on our Patreon account to get more details. Okay, on to the show. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today we have a look at Friedrich Engels' 1843 essay, Outlines for a Critique of Political Economy. This essay predates joint works with Karl Marx, such as The German Ideology and The Communist Manifesto, which are among better-known pieces of literature in the Marxist canon. We will, however, bring sections of those pieces into conversation with the essay in focus. Outlines discusses the emergence of the institution of private property from the European mercantile system and how that system of private property brings to bear on notions of competition, cost, and value. Furthermore, we will also uncover a certain moral thread in Engels' early rhetoric to spark a discussion about Marx and Engels' views on morality. Joining me today are Adam. Hello. Matt. Hi there. Will. Let's let's go. <laughs> to begin, it might be a good idea to get a little summary of this piece. So, Matt, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Um, so, by way of a really sort of short uh, summary, I suppose, um, basically what you have here, and it's, I think it's important to bear in mind, this is uh, before most of, you know, these, these major collaborative works, um, and certainly Capital Volume 1 and so on, um, is Engels is trying to provide a basic understanding of the way in which firstly that mercantilism functioned and developed, and then how that developed and changed into into capitalism. It's an openly incomplete account. It's only very partial and incomplete. But he's particularly interested here in exploring, I would say, two tensions, and, and then a third sort of idea which revolves around these two tensions. Um, the first tension is between value and price, um, and clearly that's a very key one that they develop and uh, explore in much more detail, I think, in Marx. Um, and also these idea of uh, competition and monopolies within capitalism and within uh, mercantilism uh, before it. So on, on those two notes, um, I won't go into much detail on the value and price, mostly because I think it's actually one of the less interesting parts of this essay. It's a really kind of rough and ready version of what you're going to find in their later work, and then its best theoretical expression, which was in Capital Volume 1. But the basic idea is that Bourgeois economists have misunderstood the relation between price and value, that this is sort of explainable in terms of ideology, and in particular the ideology that is latent behind political economy. And that's all there, and it's, it's fairly interesting. It's just that his understanding of it at this time is still in its early stages, I think. But there, there is also um, two more very interesting discussions on competition within capitalism and the existence of monopoly and the drive towards them within capitalism. And then, as I said, there was, there was a final topic discussed towards the end, which is Malthusianism, about how we understand the relation between production and surplus production and populations, right? So it was Malthus's idea that at a certain stage, well, not one, but systematically, humans basically become overpopulated. The resources can't sustain that population, and therefore, through a variety of ways, that surplus population is either you know killed off or the resources simply uh, dry up and everyone everyone basically dies. So the third part of this essay by Engels is a really quite harshly critical discussion of Malthus's ideas there, partly because, and this is maybe one of the common threads that you could draw between um, even this early work and you know, what Marx wrote in, in Capital 
is this notion that it's through examining the kind of best ideological representatives of these systems that you can sort of best understand how it really works in a certain way. That there's something about the misunderstandings going on in Smith and Ricardo and Malthus um, that is a necessary misunderstanding. But we can, if you focus on that, we can see what's going on beneath it. So that's about to say the, the basic outline here is simply that it's a quite early, in some ways slightly underdeveloped account of this movement towards mercantilism and mental capitalism um, with reflections upon the relation between value and price in particular and capital and labor. Um, and also this notion of monopolies within capitalism and whether that's really against the spirit of capitalism or whether it's actually much deeper than that. And then these reflections on Malthusianism as well. This text was, um, it is yeah, somewhat pre, pre-Marxist pre or pre-Marxian, but this was um, written for the, uh, the Deutsche Französische Jahrbuch, uh, which was edited by Marx at the time. And this does have a lot of the tendencies of early Marx and early Engels in which they were both heavily influenced by the humanism and the underlying moralism of people like Feuerbach, who believed that, you know, the time has come in which we just have to supersede these old categories of religion and to bring forth a new liberal society with the with the human essence, with humanism, humanity as, as its main social object of, of social flourishing. I think the economic series is generally quite, quite well done. There's some really great uh, dialectical analyses of the unity of opposites. We talk about certain sides in debates over what constitutes value in, for example, in England, but the cost production versus the French conceptions of uh, utility as the basis. And he does unify them very well for his mediating factor of competition, which I think will eventually go on to clarify notions of class struggle. But this is an incredibly undeveloped essay and its moralistic points, I think, as we'll see as we go along, harbour some quite problematic interjections from the outside, which don't really belong in, in the dialectical structure of the unfolding itself. And I think Matt was very good to bring up the idea of uh, necessary failures because as we go on the old Hegelian uh, maxim, the essence must appear. So in this appearance, this representation that people like Smith and Ricardo have given of capitalism, this misunderstanding constitutes an appearance of the productions or for itself in a way. as a way in which the reason why they have failed to properly grasp this, in, grasp this, is this essence, this representation of it, actually gives you a hint of the essence of the system itself and how this production of this sort of image of capital is produced. Yeah, I'd like to say a little bit more about that. First of all, if you're listening and you haven't read Feuerbach, you should read Feuerbach. It might be good to put a finer point on what is Feuerbachian about this analysis. The quick and dirty is basically, like for Feuerbach, that all that we believe to be good, evil, or essential to the being of man was erroneously believed to be ascribed to the divine, at one time, but now with Feuerbach, what we once thought was a divine essence is in fact a species essence, explainable in materialistic terms. All the virtues of of man are not divine in origin, but are of man. And it's interesting because I think Engels hits the right note in this essay, which is He wants to uncover the presupposition of private property. So he wants to go further than Feuerbach here, but he's invoking many of the same moralistic arguments. The moralism is there all the way through. Um, And I'm trying to use it bear in in a sort of slightly neutral sense, because um, his opposition to capitalism is not simply that, you know, we can make more stuff under communism, right? Like that's that's not it. The problem is partly that, but it's also that... um, what capitalism does is demean and destroy the lives that we all live within it. And that's that's the kind of basic moral conviction that, that is, is so apparent all the way through this, this work. That, and it, you know, it's, it's understandable because Engels was you know, really concerned about this. Anyone who reads anything about you know, the life that he lived, you know, his book about the, the working class in, in England, he was really familiar with what this life was, what life was like at the time for people who were on the, you know, the, sort of the receiving end of capital. Mm. Well, he signs um, it from Manchester. He's writing this yeah. in Manchester. Yeah, and so yes, first you can call it a kind of we can call it a kind of moralism, and we will probably talk about that. But I suppose to make an initial argument in its favour, the best way of understanding that is simply that he's really concerned with the destructive impact of capitalism against the you know the least well off. I think we can develop a reading of the morality that actually transcends the morality and talks about, for example, how 
certain kinds of antagonisms, he uses the word avarice, right? <laughs> kind of get folded back into the system of capitalism as it develops. I've written here, um, as the contradictions of capital evolve, so too does the nature of rivalry. And Engels notes that in its more primitive form, the antagonism between rivals manifests in the form of a bald-faced greed or avarice. On various sides, you have these mercantilists who are basically protecting their coffers with their arms wrapped around them, but then at one time realized, look, we can actually make more profit with a little bit of collaboration involved here. So there's a kind of effective shift that goes throughout the class that then gets sort of imported into the broader system of capitalism. So the initial violence of the early stages of capitalism now get folded into this sort of ongoing development of capital. And so I, I think for that reason, we need to be careful. Like I think in our note taking here, wherever we see a sort of moral argument deployed, maybe just flag it and think about that in terms of how are certain antagonisms or rivalries developing into contradictions. Yeah. Right? Like and, and I think this is something that Marx and Engels do down the line anyway. But one of the things here is one way in which we can sort of um revive it without having to wallow in the let's just say moralism even if that's like we'd, we'd have to explain why that would be problematizable in the first place right we can't just like we can't just accept that because this sort of disposition philosophically is like um passe now <laughs> right that it's not an effective political analysis what Engels is going to do is he's going to say that there's a deeper problem with the way in which we analyze competition in that it's not merely this sort of like um, metastructural issue, but it's actually like burdening the entire social ecology and impacting the way in which individuals communicate with one another insofar as the competition, right, is the presupposing element of any interaction between two individuals. Each person in the interaction knows that the other is trying to, for better or for worse, uh, you know, pull one over on them, right? What is that going to do to a working class in particular where that is the basis of the relationship between any two given operators in a social space? But what on the other end you see in, in Engel's sort of semi-historical analysis is a sort of shift in we'll call it for better or for worse, the ruling class's position on these issues is they, their, the nature of their competition actually starts to move into a different direction. Whereas everyone else is left in this very crude individual v. individual insofar as each individual knows that the other individual is trying to, to do something to them. And what does that mean for any sort of social cohesion or effective, effective resistance to domination? Which of course, like I have some issues with how he's going to historicize domination. I know that uh, Matt already made the, the joke about the, the factory and, and the, the propensity of the utilization of prison and so on. Um, but we'll get there. So I want to explain a point that, that Engels makes here, which I think is really a really good one, um, which is that he does talk a lot about morality, but part of it is that he's examining the discourses um, available to him within the political economist. Part of that discourse says that this competition between individuals raised up to the level also then of, of nations, but you know, with, it, with, with trade, right, competition of trade has sort of led to this era of peace. If we have disagreements, we've sold it, sold it through, you know, not selling stuff rather than killing them, etc. The moral argument from the political economists is that this expansion of competition to all levels has actually ushered in this kind of much more moral and state affairs, right? Yeah, like McDonald's theory, right? Two countries with a McDonald's won't go to war with one another. Yeah. And so Engels is going to say, well, he's going to say quite a few things, but one of the things that struck me initially is just that this is underwritten by a much more basic and more systematic Im immorality as well. When, when Will was talking about, you know, this competition going on between individuals um, and how, how we perceive one another, Engels is going to say that that's underpinned by a kind of worship of greed and selfishness and trying to do down other people so that we can profit. It, it rests upon, uh, in, in many cases, just dishonesty and also sort of a valorization of dishonesty. I mean, as far as this thing which I want to sell, I need to sort of oversell it, right? If you think it's worth X, and I think actually I, want, I can get more from you if I can sort of convince you that it actually has all these things which it doesn't have, which you know, maybe you can see that as a sort of precursor to more recent theories of ideology, G-Jack and the Coke can or something, Coke bottle. 
they'll on the one hand say that at this uh, larger level that this is now a more moral um, system, and then Engels is going to say that this basic hypocrisy misses the much more basic and commonplace immorality that the system relies upon in order to get there. Just on the topic of moralism, yeah, I think there's um, it's very good you brought up the idea of you know the the liberal sense of free trade, you know, gives peace and unity of all nations and all that bollocks. Always, it always has an underlying hostility, not even in the sense of the the imperialists starting the opium wars on China for the principles of, oh no, they must let us freely trade this to struggle with them. Or even in the, oh, there was a, relatively recently, they had planned to make a Brexit 50p coin, which says, you know, like it's, like, it's, like, it's like peace and friendship with all nations. And, you know, <laughs> we all know, we all know that's a load, a load of bullshit, but I think there's also, I mean, you could critique, not, yes, yeah, it's, it's important not to critique the moral, the, the moral argument simply as moral, because, at the end of the day, there must be an argument from a kind of position of what is to be done, what should be done, and you can't simply rhetorically disavow that by just saying the process is there and it's better to go with it than without it. And you know, unlike certain contemporary thinkers, but there's also a sense in which you can. I think if I if I if I'm critiquing the moralism in this essay, I'm critiquing it in the sense in which it sometimes it comes across as one over substantializing sort of the the personal aspects in the, of, of capitalism in the form of, of like a judgment, like character judgment. And I think sometimes he does borrow some judgments of character and discourses in discourses of his time that lead him towards some very racialized moral notions, as we'll see. But also in the idea that sometimes, uh, not even as a hypocrisy, but sometimes the imposition of morality here is a bit too external to the method, you know, the imminent critique of it. And sometimes he seems to bring that in from the outside. I mean, the idea of the you know, the humanity of it, that's completely superfluous because in a way, you know, as, as eventually he will, he will learn in 1844 when, when, when the Stirner's book comes out and he reads it and he goes to Marx saying, oh, this is great. He, 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 go, he drops his critique of the egoistic nature of capital and goes towards the idea of the structural notion of capital. Not to bring this idea of the human in because otherwise you replace the monopoly of property with the monopoly of the, the, the human essence. And that's the thing I'm sort of. Get, I'll, I'll, I'll be. Go, I'll be going after in this essay. No, and I think that I think that's totally fair because I think it's a limit to the frame. Yeah, one of the ways that we can sort of ironclad Engels' argument is if we believe that there's any inherent value in the truth, ethically speaking or otherwise, politically speaking, um, then yeah, capitalism is going to be immoral on many counts. Why? Because the whole notion of value, like Matt pointed out, and of course Engels points out here, trades on deceptions. Of, of so many different kinds. You know, for example, the, the example that I put down is when the little kid goes to the market to buy the, the watercolor set or the little dollhouse, and it has that little plastic window to show you what's in the box. Then you open the box and there's far less in there than was suggested by the size of the box. That is at one level of deception. And there's all kinds of deceptions motivating the notion of value. But also too, I think at a deeper level, and maybe to bring in Deleuze and Gattari here just a little bit too, the division between capital and labor trades on a kind of deception. Deleuze and Gattari say a false movement where the 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 whole the value of capital for Marx and Engels and for Deleuze and Gattari trades on the notion that somehow somewhere along the lines that labor gets divided from capital and is no longer a part of capital. And from that division, it effectuates other kinds of disjunctions in the form of things like costs and price, who's a producer and who isn't a producer and so forth. So, I I mean, I'll kind of let it stand there. And this is one of the reasons that I don't want to lose morality in in totality, but we want to bring in a sort of a structural analysis. Maybe if we distinguish morality from ethics here, because ethics is a a question sort of fundamentally of orientation, whereas morality is a question of sort of propositional judgment. What should I do? A good person does this, a bad person does that. And ethics is kind of like an orientation thing. So you can even distinguish this between the idea of a reaction to capital versus a, an ethical reorientation to, to the process itself. Because maybe, you know, seeing the horrors of capital, even it's uh, relatively sort of somewhat arguably early stages as, as Marx and Engels did, a moral judgment could be something, I mean, this is obscene. You know, we used to have this, now we're reduced to this. And there's a sense of which, you know, there's an inherent idea in this moral, moral idea of justice where we right the wrongs by going back to a state in which of, of, of equilibrium. Whereas an ethical take on capital could be something along the lines of, well, now this process of production is released, how can we orient this system and ourselves 
such that this uh, extends our power in the Spinoza sense, that we become better from it and we become better people in a better world from this uh, orientation. That's sort of a more forward thinking way of thinking about the, not the, yeah, the ethics as opposed to morality of, of, of a, a, a post capitalist or a communist project. And maybe this is part of the issue with uh, the way in which the the economists that are in um, Engels sites, the way that they approach labor, right? Um, labor is silent, uh, at least to Engels. I mean, I don't I don't know if it's necessarily true with like he'll he probably won't make that same assertion about Smith, but mm. like with Ricardo, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, Engels is going to is going to focus there. So I think maybe ethical orientation may be the way in which we save ourselves or not ourselves angles from um, falling into, to, you know, that sort of literary neurotic black hole. I mean, even, even sort of the arch anti-humanist Althusser, it's not that he doesn't, I mean, his sort of anti-humanism gets misunderstood sometimes. I think it's not so much that he just doesn't care about, you know, the impact that capitalism has on us or, you know, the, the human figure, what he's trying to do when he, when he's talking about sort of removing the human, what he means is that our structural analysis needs to focus less on the individuals than the structural places they inhabit, right? Um, and the relation between those positions. So that that's, you know, even someone takes it that far as Althusser does, even he's not necessarily saying, you know, ethics or whatever doesn't necessarily matter. Um, you know, we just need to understand capital, in which case it becomes this kind of um, masturbatory exercise, right? Who can give the best explanation of capitalism? Right. Um, so, you, you know, even for him, it, it's still about when you in, removing the human from the analysis only insofar as what he's interested in is the structural relations, um, which are also non deterministic for him. But um, that's enough about Althusser. Um, I, I think I went quite a few weeks without talking about him, but we should probably get back to Engels now. I wanted to finish up my discussion of Engels and Marx and morality by reading a short section from the German ideology, which is going to allow me to put a finer point on my thesis. I like to think of a defense of Marxian ethics from a Spinozist standpoint. When we talk about what a body can do, I mean, in a Marxian sense, we're talking about what a worker can do. And what does that mean? That's about having a consciousness and a kind of productivity, a mode of productivity that's both coextensive and coterminal with the interests of the worker. And to me, that means nothing short of not only producing your own material goods and owning the means of production, but also being able to own the ideological or subjectivating means of production by producing the kinds of values that enable a sustainability of that means of ownership. And like I said, I have two sections highlighted here. The first one starts, the way in which man or people produce their means of subsistence depends first of all on the nature and the actual means of subsistence they find in existence and have to reproduce. This mode of production must be considered simply as being the production of the physical existence of the individuals. Rather, and I have this part highlighted, it is a definite form of activity of these individuals, a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and how they produce. And then here's the, the, the more kind of famous section. In contrast to German philosophy, which descends from heaven to earth, we must ascend from earth to heaven. That is to say, we do not set out from what men say, imagine, conceive, nor from men as narrated, thought of, imagined, conceived, in order to arrive at men in the flesh. We set out from real active men or people on the basis of their real-life processes. We demonstrate the development of the ideological reflexes and echoes of this life process. And it kind of goes on from there. I think that's what it comes down to, you know, either in a universal sense or in some sort of localized sense that workers have agency about the things that they create. And that's the ultimate ethical priority for them. Yes. <laughs> mic, mic drop. I, I like, like, I think that's the adequate way to, to, to provide. Okay. So I look when I, when I read Marx and Engels, like I, I always go back to, to some of the, 
the elements of the 1844 uh, manuscripts, which I know is probably not the best way to do it. But that's just the mistake that I make as a student, and I'll bear that uh, with me. It, it, it is about how fields of possibility are circumscribed, right? And the way in which these trajectories of like, whether they be individual subjects or entire like sociopolitical projects, the way in which they're redirected and reoriented because of notions of valorization and so on. So I think that's a great way to, to put it. Beyond that, I, I don't think that uh, that there's much we would have to, to say to sort of um, point out what the structural issue in this essay is. And I think Adam has already talked about how on the basis of maybe a particular reading of Feuerbach, we get these uh, problems. Given we've kind of hit a point there without without discussion of that. Um, one of the uh, discussions in Engels' paper, which I found really interesting, and maybe I, I think others here did as well, is the discussion of um, competition and uh, in, in competition in relation to monopolies, right? Because one of the interesting observations that uh, Engels makes here, um, I don't know if this, if this is unique to this paper, but he says at one point, you've destroyed the small monopoly, so the one great basic monopoly property may function more freely and unrestrictedly. Um, and then it says, you've civilized the ends of the earth to a new terrain for the deployment of your vile avarice. You've brought the fraternization of the peoples, but that fraternity is the fraternity of thieves. And then, actually, this is worth reading too, you've reduced the number of wars to earn all the bigger profits in peace, to intensify to the utmost the enmity between individuals, the ignominious war of competition. Um, and then says, what have, you, what, have you, what have you ever done out of pure humanity rather than through uh, immoral egotistical motives, he says. And so he starts with this sort of claim that you, know, this, you can abolish, they've abolished in, certain, in some senses the great monopolies that came before, particularly in relation to you know, the guilds and so on. But his point is that the most basic monopoly of all of them, which is private property, um, that's why they did it, right? To, to extend that most basic monopoly to the furthest reaches of the globe. And I think that was that's an interesting way of putting it. I like that. It's not unique to his paper. I think they've expressed this multiple times elsewhere, but that was an enjoyable part. You know, you get this sense with Engels of his paper and elsewhere that the ideological representation of capitalism as a system of competition is undermined by its inherent tendency towards monopoly, right? Um, and it's underwritten by the most basic of all monopolies, but then more in a more fine-grained sense, um, always tends towards this. And he does he, he discusses this throughout the throughout the essay. Monopoly really is the the end goal. I mean, even in a purely psychological sense, the, the, the business owner wants to be the only business owner in a certain sense, right? Um, even though society as a whole benefits from not having just one business owner in that case, he says that that's exactly where this tension comes from. It's the, um, the ideals that capitalism has sort of uh, asks us to identify with an act, act according to produce this sort of tension between the interests of individuals and interests of uh, the whole, I suppose you could put it. When we talk about this discussion, you know, how should I understand my individual uh, interests uh, against you know, societal interests? Um, I, I think that Engels is just going to say that this is a kind of uh, a false appearance, right? It's a false appearance of a real movement, to you know, invert that in a way. The real movement is right there at the base in private property, and that's what gives rise to it. Um, so you can't not have these con these conflicts on top of that, right? So it's not that there's nothing going on there. It's that if you focus only on the question of you know individual uh, interests versus societal interests, you miss that it's produced by a much more basic and structural uh, force there, which is private property for him. It's so fascinating to me the one way which we can sort of update this for like the neoliberal contemporary world is that like there are a lot of uh, political operators who tell their constituency that you know, this sort of, um, the individual elements of, of capital produce these market forces, right, which then allow the individual to have sort of a vast array of choices. But then on the other end, right, the individuals who are emitting sort of those commodities into the market, right, their incentive, right, is actually the elimination of the broader array of differences. So there's another sort of I guess the joke would be like a meta shtick going on here, right? Where at one end it's saying we produce this sort of heterogeneous 
uh, array of products, right? But all of these products are individually attempting to fucking eliminate each other. Um, so it's just it's just interesting that that tendency just never goes away because, right? The market is the thing we're all told is is good, but each of those individual actors in the market are actually all trying to dissolve it. I like the analysis Engels gives here of the idea, you know, as you said, of capital always trying, you know, people are trying to win in the market, but winning is inherently against the market insofar as winning tries to bring everything under a sort of a monopolistic, a monolithic private property, but private property only ever functions as differentiation from being against the private property of others. So there's an inherent contradiction here, which, mo- which motivates the whole process. At the same time, I really fucking hated this passage. The other stuff about you know, pure <laughs> humanity and avarice. I mean, he doesn't think he is, but he's acting. He's writing as if he's talking to, you know, the CEO of private property, the private, <laughs> you know, the, the the owner. Like in the same way that Feuerbach speaks of, like the human being, and this human being is conflated with the human who is always imperfect and never actually, you know, the pure humanity. You know, this God is revealed as the human essence, and here he's almost seen like an anti an anti God. As the, as the essence of pure inhumanity, which is capital, it's so overly humanized. Like, who, who is private property? Sorry, who is this? Who, who are you talking to? Who is this, <laughs> this avaricious being? And well, and this this pure this representation of it is just it's so easy to fall into the most ironically un, unethical pitfalls. And this idea of you know it, this is this is pure egoistic competition. And I think he does change his mind on this later. When he comes to Stern, because Stern's critique of sort of competition is that you know, are we really doing competition here? If I am, if I am inherently restricted to competing within the bra- within the bounds of uh, the property that the state has, has has recognized for you, if I was going to be compete, if labor was going to be competing with capital more, wouldn't we steal more from you? Kind of thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, like wouldn't I be able to get like the laser blaster and say hand it over on the timeline, right? You know, these capitalists aren't egoistic enough, and neither are the people who should be fighting them and insurrecting against them every opportunity. Not egoistic enough. I like that. <laughs> Humanity bad. Read the right to be greedy by for ourselves. You know, communism is seizing the means of subject production, and it's owning them to better ourselves. God damn it! You heard this discourse here first. Well, then maybe it's time to talk about some of the other. Uh, analytical issues that 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 I had with this um, with this paper, and one of them is going to be the way in which uh, Engels treats uh, the discursive elements of capital. And uh, I know that Matt was baiting me earlier today. Uh, I know in, I would never do that. A little you. chat <laughs> by posting this quote. I'll just read it quickly. The extension of the factory system is allowed ev- uh, is followed everywhere by an increase in crime. The number of arrests of criminal cases, indeed, the number of murders, burglaries, petty thefts, etc., for a large town or district, can be predicated year by year with unfailing precision, as has been done often in England. Um, so he's essentially arguing that industrialization leads to a sort of proliferation of criminal behaviors without being able to critically assess all of the other institutions that might also develop alongside the factory. He's just accepting on the face the relationship between the juridical nature of crime and the act without actually being able to, to critically analyze uh, that relationship, right? So he's going to do the thing that Foucault says uh, post-industrial society works towards, right? Which is ensuring a one-to-one relationship between the act of the crime and the arrest and the sentencing. And of course, not being able to see even just how uh, post-industrial or industrialized spaces might actually not create a proliferation of activity, but indeed a proliferation of criminals and crime in the same way that if one wants to see a constitution in disarray, right, one only has to look for 56 different amendments being added in five years, right? So there is sort of this broader problem where in the same way that uh, he has a very, I'm going to say to the point of malignancy, a very uh, broad and all-encompassing understanding of human essence, he also carries with him these other, let's say, like socio-juridical 
or political philosophical uh, issues into this uh, into this project. I will say just to um, stick up my my boy angles here. Um, <laughs> I agree with almost I, well everything that Will said. The only point I would add is that it, what what Engels is trying to get at is that insofar as competition comes to dominate every aspect of the human experience, um, that extends therefore also to to crime. And so I know he gets this wrong and in a bad way, as Will puts it. Um, but in a certain way, I suppose what he's probably trying to do is say crime as a bad thing is caused by the very conditions made possible by capitalism. Yeah, literally yeah, by, by supply, supply and demand. demand. <laughs> he says. So I think everything Will said, just that the intention there is clearly to say like, this stuff's bad. We don't want people like stealing each other. But yeah, but but let's but let's let's admit that that's that that's sort of a strange way to oh, yeah. apply it's weird your how he goes framework. To, like, even if, right. you know, I was going to like apply um, the it's... concept of competition to how that works with you know uh, criminality or something like. And even though I wanted to go for the, the kind of approach that he did, I still don't know that I'd, I'd cash it out in terms of society creating a demand for crime that is met by a corresponding supply. I don't know if, if that's even the way you'd want to go with that one. But yeah, exactly. And he almost gets to the the pro in like the following section where like it literally opens with the struggle of capital and land against labor. He does understand the sort of broader antagonism, but he's trying to well, essentially he's 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 doing what philosophers in this modernist era did, right? They're attempting to create a framework under which they can analyze almost everything. And in some spaces, it works really well. And then in others, it shows a sort of uh, other possibilities of analysis where like your position is still super valuable and opens up doors to a new analytic, but don't foreclose on those new doors by simply wanting to carry through the framework, right? The framework can open up, um, let's say, new ways of analyzing old problems, but don't just try to force through yeah. your framework on those old problems. Allow those frameworks to open up new ways to orient yourself towards these things. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly undialectical in that sense. Yeah, I, I would agree, yeah. One of the important things that I think we should turn to at this time is the discussion of Malthus at the end of this essay. Because often, if you're studying Marx and Engels for the first time, or if you're just on the internet, you might hear, oh, that's a Malthusian argument. I, I recently remember, I think it was Ted Cruz who accused the left of being Malthusians recently. Right. I don't know, maybe, Will, you, you saw that. I, I'm not sure. But... Um, Yes, I did. And it, it's pain. Yeah. I, feel pain. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? But I think maybe it's, it's good to get a handle on, like, what is wrong with Malthus's argument? It's not only one that belies the facts about our ability to produce for populations, but it's also one that's normally tagged as being inherently racist. Well, Malthus's fundamental problem, as Engels points out, is uh, that he confuses the means of subsistence with the means of employment. Uh, and in that sense, he sort of overly substantializes relations of production and fundamentally misunderstands what production is. He thinks that if, you know, we only have so much subsistence <laughs> to go around, and if we if we use all of it up, then uh, you know we're all going to be in trouble. So we need to control the population, and it's he's essentially an ideologist for uh, you know mass death and particularly high child mortality rates. But as Engels points out, this misunderstands. I mean, he says, you know, how, how on earth could you have these children in the first place? If anything, people die in these sort of circumstances from an abundance, not a lack, because fundamentally, labor is is inherently overproductive. And he says, you know, he, gives, he gives a case of England, like this is a, a case of uh, overproduction in which people lack employment, not subsistence. And that is why they are starving, even in the face of an abundance of production. And I mean, if Malthus is inherently theological and moralistic in his impulse, and this is why I think we need to bring really Cameron and the anti Feuerbachianism, because the argument from Malthus is, is it's fundamentally bad for, for our souls. And if it's bad, <laughs> you know, Engels can't come in and say it's bad for the human essence. But at the same time, he can point out the fundamental hypocrisy of you're, you're, over, you're giving our current relations of production too much credit by making them to a natural law through a vague analogy. And in that sense, Mal Malthus is fundamentally wrong. I think he does. I think if I was going to, if I was going to reviewing this as like a, uh, an essay submitted, I would think he, the Malthus stuff is a bit, overly uh, it's a bit fast but he does rely on critique of uh, by allison which at the time must have been pretty commonly articulated i mean malthus was already go going at going out of fashion by then even though even though his influence does still 
uh, last uh, through Darwin. But yeah, I think, yeah, Craig, you'd be probably more to say on this. In terms of Malthus' influence today, I think of the zero population growth movements and, and what is it, the Club of Rome? Yeah. Those folks, you know, yeah. they, they kind of have a, a sort of Malthusian bent to them. David Attenborough. Which is, which, uh, well, can we talk about how strange it is, the uh, propensity for political economic theorists like Piketty to constantly evoke time, uh, invoke time and time again, the limitations of Malthus, Ricardo, and Smith. And then just simply overlook Marx and Engels. And I just think it's odd to me that this, this invocation of Malthusianism uh, over and over again, and the way in which he frames scarcity is uh, not, it's just, it's not necessarily what Malthus, the, the way in which it's invoked to, today is not exactly what Malthus was fundamentally going after. And in fact, you get a better understanding of how to criticize uh, the Malthusian position from Marx and Engels than you could by trying to go after sort of the meme. Does that make sense? I think so. You mean by the caricature of Malthusianism? Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know if I have much more to add to that, except to say that, you know, one of the, the Marxian responses is that whenever we see words like overpopulation, for example, or high birth rate, low poverty areas. Um, those are often the sort of like go-to channels to begin the sort of Malthusian line of thinking. But often the way of addressing this in a sort of Marxian way is by just showing the disparities uh, between the kinds of communities, the, the, the sort of pitched communities that, that capitalism creates, you know, where you have folks, for example, in the global north who are, who are more well off, the governments and businesses from the global north have expropriated resources from those areas, and the offset would be not to manage population itself, but instead to stem the expropriation, maybe even pay reparations, and also enable those workers to be able to seize the means of production for themselves. Yeah, and so in response to Malthus, uh, Engels, well, he's, he obviously makes a, num a number of points, but I think in the end he comes down to two two central ones. Um, he says to so Mal Malthus, uh, is towards the end of the essay, uh, Malthus establishes a formula on which he bases his entire system. Population is said to increase in a geometrical progression, one plus two plus four plus eight plus six plus and so on. The productive power of the land is an uh, arithmetical pro uh, uh, progression, one to two, three, four, five, six. The difference is obvious, it's terrifying, but is it correct? Where has it been proved? The productivity of a land increases in this way. And he says, well, the extent of a land is limited. Okay. Um, but aside from anything else, he says two things. Firstly, it underplays very importantly the, the role of science in the development of the productivity of this land and of labor which uh, worked upon it. Um, and that's, that's, that's not a small thing, but it overlooks this in quite an important way. And the other point is a slightly simpler one, which is that uh, he says it's absurd to talk of overpopulation as long as there's enough, wa enough wasteland in the valley of Mississippi for the whole population of Europe to be trans transplanted there. Um, as long as no more than one third of the earth can be considered cultivated, and as long as the production of this third itself can be raised sixfold and more by the application of improvements already known. So he says, on the one hand, the theory itself looks dubious. Um, you know, just in terms of the analysis of how these things progress, um, and that this has important consequences in particular because we uh, overlook the possibilities already there to us, right? Um, and so that, that's at least part of Engels' answer to, to Malthus there. I always thought that one of the challenges of, of this line of thinking developed by Engels here and later in Marx and Engels regarding the the indispensability of planet Earth to provide our means of sustenance. At one level, you know, at the sort of humanist level of things, uh, of course, yeah, I want to be able to eat, I want to be able to live comfortably. However, to think of things in strictly humanistic terms and ignore the notion of a total ecology or sustainability within a, in an ecology seems to me to be primary over and above, especially these days now that capitalism is as advanced as it is and in consideration of how far and widespread its negative externalities are, I think this is a much better and more urgent starting point in consideration of what liberation means under capitalism. Sure. Yeah, no, I think there is a, 
there is a, a really important debate to be had here. And I think we would need to do that on a, another um, episode to give it give it its due. But I think you're right. I mean, I don't actually think that not only what Malthus we can sort of set aside, right? But some of the sort of concerns you get today about, you know, sustainability and, uh, yeah. And eco-fascism, right. Yeah. right? Like, let's just be clear about what the final implications of yeah. these invocations in the modern That's era of Malthusian pessimism get. actually yeah. are. It always does. It yeah. always ends and up And then eco-fascism. Um, so. But, you know, there's, there's interesting debates that have been playing out about uh, sort of Prometheanism in particular, in uh in marxist theory and what that means for uh i guess the kinds of environmental concerns that i think anyone living in 2021 would you know has to have right um so i was gonna bring it back to another topic earlier but i don't want to do that if there's stuff anyone else wanted to say anyway yeah i just wanted to add some other stuff just to round off some of the, the moralistic critiques here and you find this in in some of the things marx is writing but i mean marx's own <laughs> Uh, a relation to his own, you know, personal ethnic subject position is, is not something I'm, I'm particularly qualified to comment on. But the ways in which he moralizes against certain aspects of capitalism here, particularly the way he, you know, he puts it down to like a failure of pure humanism, uh, an immorality, an egoism built into a failure to uh, adopt the human essence, and which is in which is in Feuerbach's terms is the the essence of Christianity. The human essence is the, the Christian essence perfects itself and is actually a, an estranged version of human essence. And because of this, he makes some moral judgments, which are, in my view, ex- external to the method of the text, but at the same time situate Engels in prejudices of his own time. So, example, in, in one part, he talks about uh, the immorality of certain practices in contemporary capitalism. And there's a quote here. He talks about the, div- the divisions of, of capital and profit and you know, into different um, sections and practices. So he says here, indeed, even profit is in its turn split into interest and profit proper. In the case of interest, the absurdity of these splits is carried to the extreme. The immorality of lending at interests, of receiving without working, merely for making a loan, though already implied in private property, is only too obvious and has long ago been recognised for what it is by unprejudiced popular consciousness, which in such matters is usually right. Now, unprejudiced popular consciousness. <laughs> I mean, Sus. I would like, I would like to find an unprejudiced popular consciousness is so usually right, and particularly yeah. is usually right about the morality of receiving interests, which, yeah. which, which was which was which was known in medieval times as usury, which is a, a very common trope of anti-Semitism because tradition, you know, because of the historical place and people being able to work in in certain, those sorts of professions, and it's. I, I think this 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 was very this was very disappointing, and I think it is completely it's it's completely superfluous, and he and it, it it's not only it's not only this. Um, here's one point he talks about the stock speculation. He says you know the speculator always counts on disasters, particularly on bad harvests. He utilizes everything, for instance, New York fire, in its time, and in morality, his culminating point is the speculation on the stock exchange, where history and with it mankind is demoted to a means of gratifying the avarice of the calculating or gambling spectator. That's not necessarily bad analysis. It's just about you know we've seen this in the old GameStop bullshit, short squeezes and hedge funds, etc. Then he goes after a uh, different class of the merchant who thinks you know they're not. They think oh they're not part of this. We're not doing stock speculation. And he says quote. And let not the honest, respectable merchant rise above the gambling on the stock exchange. The Pharisiac, as in Pharisee, I thank thee, O Lord, etc. Now, you know, of course, the Pharisees were uh, Jewish religious authorities at the time, and I'm. This isn't as clear cut as the the stuff on on interest, but you, you do read that in in light of that previous passage, and you think, uh, I, I, I mer- merchants, Pharisiac, Pharisiac is not going to be a word that's going to be hard to translate from the original German or misconstrued. I'm just, I read that and I was like, Ooh, yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's important. Yeah. It's important. It's, to break uh, his issues I mean, out. I mean it, it, who's he hanging about with at this time? You know, Feuerbach, uh, Bruno Bauer, I think, you know, who wrote the original text, uh, on the, the Judenfrage on, on the Jewish question that Marx eventually responded to in his own way, which is itself problematic. And was, was obviously for, for another, for another time, but, there are significant limits to the ways in which he substantializes 
the figure of capital at the same time he, as he distances it from people with the monopoly of capital itself. But if he's monopolizing it into an essence, yeah. which is he, which expresses itself in this kind of, not necessarily a personality, but a representation of a distinct character, this is where you get into these kinds of problems. You know, Jeff Bezos isn't capital. Jeff, if, if, if you know, if, if there was no Jeff Bezos, capital would invent one. <laughs> Yeah. And I think this is a, this is a severe limitation. It's it's not even yeah beyond just the look. Let's be clear, just beyond just the bigotry, right? It defeats the very um, what makes the the Marxist analysis so powerful is the invocation of these representations of individuals as broader manifestations of this tendency. It defeats the very purpose of the analytic, right? So beyond just the abhorrent, uh, bigoted elements of like, let's say where Marx agrees with Bauer in his essay, or where we get, you know, these various, uh, you know, uh, assertions about the characters of individuals. It's it's not only abhorrent uh, for that reason, but it's also defeating. Uh, like it, it, it actually becomes like a problem. I mean, what was the, for them what was the point of showing also. capital as being an inherently, you know, contradictory structure of its own self differentiations and contradictory impulses? If you're then going to subscribe it to a mono, you know, a very substantial, uh, non contradictory motion of, of human character as as a kind of evil, e- evil isn't contradictory in the, in this in this way. Well, he yeah, overly exactly. substantializes it in a way that completely undermines the, the entire analysis. And which what was the point? May, you could be that's, a populist uh, yeah. about it, but exactly, I think that's, that's the gets you if it substantializes the enemy as as by no means a part of the the structure in which you're advocating right. for. I mean, this is this is the elementary problem of populism, and I think Zizek articulates this quite well. But at the same time, it's a very popular buzzword, and sadly, we won't be gone of it for a long time. Well, I think that's one of the ironies that kind of characterizes this text, because there's some pretty bold strokes in here which prefigure stuff that he does with Marx down the line. I'm looking at the paragraph right now where he talks about um, capital and labor being identical, and then they get separated and create that sequence of divisions. When we think of what does a structural analysis of capitalism look like, those two paragraphs, I, I think, are are just chef's kiss. They're, those are pretty good. And in fact, um, I actually, I marked those because what he does there is actually a very, I would say, an adequate description of what the body of capital, with regard to the body without organs under capitalism for Deleuze and Guattari, actually is. And like, if you were doing a paper on that, this would be a go-to essay. You could actually just lift that whole paragraph out of there. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that capital must divide itself because the the definition of capital that comes up in Capital Volume 1 is capital is the command over unpaid labor. For there to be a command, there must be a division. And this is where you can get, get an ethical component in, the ethics of the command, of the judgment, and how to reorient yourself such to no longer be commanded, even be self-commanding in a way that supersedes even the, the repressive capitalists, uh, the repressive capitalist structure, sorry, as you know, it's wildest, it's wildest uh, dreams or dreams implications, let's say. And that goes right back to that little paragraph that I mentioned in the German ideology where I talked about one's agency being coextensive with one's ability to produce the things that one wants. Um. I don't know if it's necessarily all that important, other than that there was um, a, a short passage in here, um, which I found quite neatly neatly encapsulated at least something like the point they're going to uh, that Marx is going to make in Capital about um, cri- uh, economic crises under under capitalism. Um, so Engels locates this precisely in the, the price mechanism, um, in this uh, the exchange value and the way in which supply and demand work. Because, you know, it, it's important both for Engels and for Marx that we understand that you know supply and demand do have a you know a very real um, impact on uh, you know the, the just the economics we we, we live within, right? Um, but he makes a really nice point here about what this also means, um, because he says, and firstly, this is you know interesting by itself. He says that uh, for the economist. Um, this is not only a law, but uh, it, it, it's his chief glory. He cannot see enough of it and considers it in all its possible and impossible applications. 
uh, this idea of competition. Like once once they get it in, get it in their head, they just see it everywhere. Everything really is just some form of competition, one way or another, right? Um, and then he says that, um, and this is something that people, have, you know, one of the reasons why we returned to Marx after you know the recent sort of financial crises and so on. Um, for the last 80 years, he writes, these trade crises have arrived just as regularly as the Great Plagues did in the past, and they have brought in their train more misery and more, more immorality than the latter. Of course, these commercial upheavals confirm the law and confirm it exhaustively, um, but in a manner different from which, that which the economists would have us believe is the case. And he then says that, we ask the question, what are we to think of a law that only assert, that can only assert itself through periodic upheavals? Um, and so he'll, when, when, he, when we're looking at, you know, the firstly, the, you know, most of 2008 um, economic crisis, crisis, and then, you know, perhaps even what we may be experiencing quite, quite soon, um, I, would, I would sort of invite the, the, the listener to go and have a look at this um, explanation and then perhaps to go, go and have a look at capital because it's a little bit more detailed there. That for, for Engels, it's located precisely in the kind of uncertainty over um, over the, the the price and the value of any given commodity, and that capitalism lurches basically wildly between overproduction and underproduction, um, one way or the other, um, and that over time, um, if I can just find the right sentences here, uh, he says, as long as you continue to produce in the present un- in the present unconscious, faultless manner, at the mercy of chance. For just so long, trade crises will remain, and each successive crisis is bound to become more universal and therefore worse than the preceding one. I sort of enjoyed reading this, and there's parts I'm, I'm, I'm missing out because I don't want to just sort of sit and read the you know, whole paragraph <laughs> into the microphone. You know, even here, you know, well, well before you know you had Capital Volume One and so on, um, Engels is already joining this dot as well, at least in a um, in in some way here between the uh, capital's sort of inherent uh, pricing instability and the kinds of economic crises, which, as they you know completely correctly predicted, um, get not only more common but more severe as the year as the years go on, right? Um, and that, of course, that's one of the reasons why after two thousand and eight, so many people went back to reading Marx again because it was you know, right there. He'll tell you exactly why this is going to happen. Thank you once again for joining us for another episode. If you'd like to get more content, join us on Patreon. You can get in for as little as $1. At the $5 level, you can join us for our monthly reading groups. Currently, we're reading Deleuze's Difference in Repetition. And our next reading group will be at the end of March 2021. So, coming next week. If you become a patron at any level, or you're already in there, you can find the previous reading group done as a Zoom recording somewhere in our previous posts. Also, find us on Twitter, find us on Instagram, check out the blog posts, check out the merch store, and we will catch you next time. Thank you and stay safe. Thank mm-hmm. you.